Hello again everyone and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to walk you guys through the installation process for Ubuntu Server 2004. And for those of you that don't already know, the distinction between Ubuntu and Ubuntu Server is that Ubuntu Server has no graphical user interface at all. It's for those of you that want to set up, well, a server. And I'll walk you through the entire process in this video. Now I'm going to show you the process in Proxmox but it really doesn't matter what you're using for the underlying hardware. It could be a physical server, VirtualBox, or Proxmox like me, or any other kind of device that you might be able to install Ubuntu Server on, because the installation process is the same regardless of the type of underlying hardware that you have. So let's go ahead and get started and walk through the process of installing Ubuntu Server 2004. So let's go ahead and get an Ubuntu server installation going. So I'm going to open up a browser because the first thing we need to do is to go ahead and download it. So you simply go to ubuntu.com and I'll have a link in the description below that'll go directly to the download page. But basically here we get a download link if we click on that. Then down here where it says Ubuntu server, we could click on this green button here to go ahead and start the download process. And as you can see down here, it is actually downloading an ISO file. And I'll go ahead and let that finish, and I'll be right back. Okay, so the download is finished, so I'll open up a files window. Inside my downloads directory, we have the downloaded file right here. And this ISO file here, we can use to go ahead and create bootable installation media that we can use to install Ubuntu server. So if you have a physical server with a DVD drive, then you could basically use whatever your DVD burning software is to burn a bootable DVD from this ISO image. You can also write this ISO image to a flash drive, and that's the preferred way if you have physical hardware because it's much faster than a DVD is. And if you plan on using a virtual machine, well, it's even easier because all you have to do is attach this ISO image to the virtual DVD drive and boot from it, and it'll go ahead and start the process. So on my end, what I'm going to do is show you guys the process on Proxmox. The actual installation process is the same, regardless of the underlying hardware. So what I'm going to do is type the URL to the Proxmox server that I'll be using as an example in this video, and it's this one right here. And then I'll simply log in, and I'll paste in the password here. And here we go. And here I have my Proxmox server. And I've created videos about Proxmox in the past, and I'm going to be creating more in the future. So if you are interested in Proxmox tutorials, then let me know the types of Proxmox tutorials you would like to see on my channel. But let's go ahead and get started. So if I expand my server here, and then go to the ISO section, I've already added the ISO image right here to the server. I just basically copied it over to the data store. Now, like I mentioned, it doesn't really matter what virtualization software you are using because it's simply a matter of just attaching the ISO image to the virtual DVD drive of your virtualization software. And I already have it here, so I'm going to walk through the process on Proxmox. But if you're using VirtualBox, for example, you just basically go to the hardware section under settings and then add it there. And then what I'm going to do here is just go ahead and create a new VM so I'll just click Create VM right here and walk through the process. Now I'll see if I can make the font size a little bit bigger to make this easier to see. And I think that'll do just nicely. So this isn't a Proxmox tutorial, but basically I'm just giving it an ID number. And I'm just going to call this Ubuntu Server Test. And then I'll go to the OS tab here. And this is where I'm going to attach the ISO file. I simply just drop down here and then I select the live server ISO. Everything else here is good. And I'm basically just going to speed through this. I'm going to give it a couple of cores. And for memory, two gigs is fine. It's probably overkill, but you don't want to go under one gigabyte if you can help it because the installer might actually crash. It's weird, but the installer needs um, a decent amount of memory. I'm not sure why, but you could go ahead and lower the memory under a gig if you don't actually need that much on the VM. And I'll click Next. 
Next again, let's go ahead and start the VM after it gets created and I'll click finish. We can see the VM coming to life here. And here we have the console. So here we can actually press enter, we don't have to. But if we do, we get some additional options. For example, we can select our language if our language is not the default of English. And here we get the main menu. If you didn't press enter when you had a few seconds to do so at the very beginning when you saw the icon there at the bottom of the screen, then it'll bypass all of this and go straight into the installer. But I wanted to go through some of these options right here just in case this might be useful to anyone. So obviously the first option, install Ubuntu server, will get us right into the installer. We can use the up and down arrow to navigate the menu here and enter to make a selection. Now the test memory is especially important if you are running on an older server, maybe something you got from eBay. I actually recommend you test the memory of physical servers basically at least once a year. I have seen memory go bad many times. It's kind of weird. I don't know why I've run into this so many times, but sometimes I've had people on my channel complain about Linux stability and it crashing and things like that just to find out that their memory was defective. So it's a good idea to test that. If I press enter here, it gives you an idea of what the memory test utility looks like. And you just let this run for a while and then reboot. I just hit escape here. But anyway, that's what it looks like. And the install Ubuntu server with safe graphics option is basically for those of you that are having problems with the installer. If you're not having problems and you really shouldn't choose that option, but if, for example, there's an issue with the video driver and it's not able to support certain resolutions and it tries to put your display into a resolution that's not supported or any other kinds of display related problems, this might be an option you want to check out. Test memory I just mentioned and boot from first hard disk is basically if you want to bypass the Ubuntu installer and just boot into the actual operating system that's currently on the machine. But I'll choose the first option here. See if I can make this bigger. Okay, so we're going to basically let this boot up. So at the first screen here, we're basically just selecting the language for the installation process itself. I'll just press enter to select the default, but you can basically select something else by using the up and down arrows here to make a selection. Press enter. So this screen is actually very important. This live installer has the ability to basically update itself to a newer version so you can make sure that you are installing Ubuntu server with the latest version of the installer. And right here we're seeing that there's actually a newer version of the installer available. And the reason why this is important is because installer updates not only fix bugs but they also fix security issues as well. And especially on a server, you want to make sure that you are up to date in using the latest installer so that way you don't encounter any bugs. And this has happened. There was a security issue that Canonical solved with an installer update. So definitely hit that update button if you see that available. And that's the default selection. You can see it here at the bottom. Update to the new installer. I'll press enter. And it's gonna go ahead and download that. And that was actually pretty quick. So the next screen is going to give us an opportunity to basically choose a different keyboard layout. If we need to do that, it's defaulting in my case to English US. But if it's different for you, you can go ahead and hit the drop down and choose something different there. So I'll just go down here to done because that's fine for me. We'll get back to the video in just a moment, but real quick, I want to mention my sponsor, Linode. Linode has been my infrastructure provider for quite a while now and has just recently announced their own managed Kubernetes service. And this enables you to combine Linode's ease of use and simple pricing with the infrastructure efficiency of Kubernetes. With the Linode Kubernetes engine, you can get your infrastructure and workloads up and running in minutes instead of days and scale resources in real time to meet your infrastructure needs. And with Linode's managed Kubernetes engine, the pricing is simple. Only pay for what you use. And with Linode's 99.9% .9 uptime SLA and bundled transfer, you can significantly cut costs when compared to AWS, GCP, and Azure. Designed with the open source ecosystem of Kubernetes, the Linode Kubernetes engine supports integration with tools like Helm, operators, and more. To help you get started with Kubernetes, Linode gives you access to in-depth documentation, video tutorials, and webinars. 
So go ahead and sign up at promo.leno.com slash learnlinuxtv to get a $60, 60-day credit to test out LKE or any of Linode's other offerings. I appreciate Linode's continued support of Learn Linux TV. Now, let's get back to the video. And here we actually have a section where we can configure the network card. Now, if you don't see a network adapter here at all, you can see that I see one here and it has an IP address. So if that happens to you, you might have to find a driver for your network card. But as you can see here, it went ahead and detected mine. It's a virtual network card anyway. And it defaults to DHCP. We see here that I have an IP address of 10.10.10.144. That's an IP address that got assigned right from my router. And a lot of times with a server, you want a static IP address. I use DHCP reservations actually, so I almost never use that. But if you use static IPs, and I'm sure that's going to be a lot of you guys since you're basically running this on a server, you could go ahead and change the type of assignment that your network card is getting. So you could press enter here. And then we could go down here to IPv4, for example, and press enter. And by pressing enter, we can drop down here and choose manual if we wanna go ahead and have a static IP. So in that case, we just go ahead and fill out everything here. So we just type the network subnet that it was assigned. Then the actual IP address itself goes right here. The gateway. And then the DNS server. And then so on. And then normally you just go down here and click save. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to accept the DHCP address that I was given. But if you want to go ahead and create a static IP, well, this is how you do it. You just choose the manual method, you fill out all the fields, and then you press enter on the save button here. So again, that's okay for me. DHCP is fine. So I'll just go down here to done and press enter. If you have a proxy server, you can go ahead and put it in here. I don't have one, so I'll just press enter on done to bypass this. And here we have the ability to add a custom repository, a custom mirror for the packages for Ubuntu server. For most of you guys, the default that you see here will be fine. Some of you out there might run your own custom Ubuntu mirror internal on your LAN, which is pretty awesome. If that's you, you can go ahead and put in the URL to that repository right here. I'm gonna go ahead and press enter to accept the default. And then here we have the ability to partition the disk. If you want to do something custom, you can go ahead and do that. But you can also go down here to encrypt the LVM group with LUX. If you want to have full disk encryption, if you are going to be saving very confidential information on your server, this might be a good option for you. I'll leave that unchecked for now. And I'm not going to go over custom layouts here, but if that's something you want to do, you have an option here for that. So let's go ahead and proceed. And here it's going to give you an overview of all of the changes it wants to make. So for example, we have a volume group that will be named Ubuntu VG. So this is going to be an LVM volume group. I do have an LVM tutorial on my channel already. You should definitely check out if you want to know more about what LVM is and how it works. And down here, it's basically showing that it's going to be using the local disk to create that LVM setup. And that's basically what's going to be underneath the volume group for LVM. Then down here, it lists all the partitions it wants to create to go ahead and set up this LVM configuration for us. I'll go ahead and choose done. It's good enough for me. And it's basically just confirming that by going further, we will be wiping out the entire drive, which is fine. There's nothing on it anyway. And we could go ahead and set up our profile. I'm going to just keep it simple. This field here is basically where you give your server a name. I'm just going to call mine Ubuntu server. But I recommend using a name that's descriptive, like file server, web server, whatever the case might be. Or you could have a naming scheme. I mean, some people use, you know, cartoon characters, Donald Duck or Daffy Duck or something like that. I'll leave that up to you. So down here, it's asking for you to choose a username and then also set up a password. And this password will be used for privileged commands as well. For example, with sudo. So you definitely want to make sure that you remember this password there is no root account on Ubuntu by default. When you have all the fields filled out, you just go down here to done and press enter. And now we have an option to install OpenSSH. 
And I recommend that most of you do this because it's a great way to do remote administration on your server. Now, if you have a display and keyboard plugged into your server and that's how you intend to use it, then you don't actually need this. But what OpenSSH does, for those of you that don't know, it gives you the ability to do remote administration from the comfort of your desk. And that's a good benefit to have. So I'll just go ahead and check that box right there. And down here, it's beyond the scope of the video, but you can actually import an SSH key if you have one already created. But I'm gonna go down here to done and press enter. Now this menu is a lot of fun. It gives you the ability to basically install some awesome server apps with no configuration or little configuration required. So for example, if you wanted to set up a Nextcloud server, then you could simply press the space bar here to check this box and you'll have Nextcloud, that's pretty cool. And if you wanna go ahead and set up Docker or any of these other things here, you can go ahead and choose accordingly. Now, I'm gonna leave that up to you, but I don't need any of these for my server, so I'll just go down here to done and press enter. And right now it's installing and setting up Ubuntu server here, and it's currently installing OpenSSH. And right now it's actually downloading and installing security updates. Now you can go ahead and cancel this if you don't want to have the security updates just yet, but I recommend that you go ahead and let this continue. It's definitely a great thing to start with the latest security updates already installed. So I'll let this finish and then I'll be right back. So the installation is now finished. At the bottom of the screen, it was showing cancel updates as the last option, which now changed to reboot. So I'll just go ahead and choose that and press enter. And then we can go ahead and start our server. Now this failed to unmount CD-ROM error right here is actually very common. And we can just simply press enter here and it should still reboot. And you can see that we briefly had a login prompt right here. What it's going to do now is it's going to go ahead and run some post installation steps. It's basically done already because the SSH host key step is the last one. So I'll press enter here and that's going to take us to the login screen. I'm going to go ahead and try to clear the screen here. And now we can go ahead and log in with the username and password that we set up during the installation. And we should be good to go. As you notice here, we only have the command line, which is basically the standard when it comes to server installations. There is a way to add a GUI that's beyond the scope of this video. Most servers will not have a GUI. But right here, we have a command line. We can go ahead and set up whatever it is we want to serve on our server. We should be good to go. So there you go. That was my walkthrough for installing Ubuntu Server 2004. I hope you found that helpful. And if you're into Linux and servers, then I highly recommend you check out my Ansible tutorial series, which is actually on my channel right now. Most of the videos have already been uploaded in the series, with more coming soon, but they might all be available depending on when you're watching this. And that series will walk you through automating your Linux servers and automating the configuration. It's just going to be awesome. Definitely check that out. If you like this video, please click that like button because that lets YouTube know that you want to see more Linux content just like this. And I will see you in the next video.